Good morning, dear saints, and welcome to Thy Strong Word, Blessed Pentecost Tuesday. Today is Tuesday, May 21st, and you're listening to the program where each weekday morning we explore the Holy Scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Well, today the church celebrates and observes Emperor Constantine, who was the first Christian emperor. He and his mother, Helena, who's also remembered on this day, planted, or I should say funded, churches around the empire. A wonderful Christian leader uh, certainly has his faults, but we are blessed that he was able to be instrumental, he and his mother, in spreading Christianity around the Roman Empire. Today, we also are going to open up a new book in Proverbs, chapter 20, verses 1 through 15. There, Solomon is warning us against the dangers of wine and strong drink, emphasizing that they can lead to mockery and brawling. He highlights the value of prudence, hard work, honest dealings, too. The passage underscores the importance of things like just weights and measures, basically avoiding deceit and fraud, and the significance of wise counsel. Solomon reflects on the preciousness of wisdom and knowledge as he's been doing, and he advocates for a life of integrity and diligence. Thanks for tuning in. You know the drill. You can listen online, over the air, using the KFU app, or through your favorite podcasting service. Hey, you can even just ask your smart speaker to tune into KFUO or Thy Strong Word, and it'll do it. Really, anywhere that there's an internet connection, you can tune into KFUO's faith-affirming programming, and of course, our little show. Do me a favor and share the program with your friends and family. Send them over to kfuo.org forward slash Thy Strong Word. Thy Strong Word is supported in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. They do amazing work for the kingdom. I've been a fan of LHF long before I was uh, privileged to host the show or that they were a sponsor. I used their services when I went to Haiti for some great uh, catechisms in Haitian Creole. I used it when I was uh, ministering. My congregation was ministering to Hispanics with some of their Spanish materials. You, too, should discover the impactful work of LHF and what they can do for your outreach ministry by visiting them online at lhfmissions.org. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, there are three ways to reach out. By email at pastorboo at gmail.com, through Facebook, just search for me and send me a message. And usually by phone, but right now our phone lines are down in the studio, so you can't call in today. I'm sorry about that. But you can write the number down for the future. It's 1-800-730-2727. Just don't try to call it today. Well, let's get right to it. This is why you're here. Dive into the Word of God. And joining us this morning to help us with that is the Reverend John Schenck, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Edwardsville, Illinois. Welcome back to the program. Welcome back to Proverbs. We're still making our way through it. I'm glad to have you here for it, brother. Well, glad to be here, too. Um, If I could share my story with uh, Lutheran Heritage Fund. Please. Um, I I have a member from from Africa, and their child was uh, getting confirmed. One of the the boys was getting confirmed, and... um, their grandmother was was coming, and she spoke Swahili. And uh, at that time, we had someone come through. I think the school must have been doing chapel offerings um, for uh, the Heritage Foundation, Heritage Fund. And um, so they came out, and I had told them about that. They sent me some materials for her, like a catechism and some other like storybooks. And I gave it to her and she was just crying uh, that they had uh, things for her. She was just overjoyed. Um, So it's just an amazing work and something that should be uh, supported full, full and wholeheartedly. Yeah, it really should. And and yeah, they sponsor the show. They certainly contribute to helping this show go on the air. But I got to tell you, these services they provide, if you're thinking, well, it might be kind of expensive, they send it to you completely free of charge. Now, they certainly will accept donations. That's up to you. But they will send it to you completely free of charge. That's a blessing, too. Well, yeah, that's a great story. I mean, as we come into, I guess, as the world becomes smaller and smaller and become more and more intercultural, it's all the more important to realize that we are called to, well, proclaim the gospel to all nations. Sometimes that means going uh, places where we don't quite know the language. And, well, it's Pentecost. I guess we could hope the Holy Spirit would... (laughs) 
just give us the gift of speaking in languages we haven't previously learned, but it doesn't seem to be his will most of the time. So we're going to go ahead and uh, stick with translation. So yeah, yeah let's, uh, let's dive in though. But before we do, go ahead and uh, open us up for a word of prayer, please. Yeah, let us pray. Lord God, bless your word wherever it is proclaimed. Make it a word of power and peace and convert those who have not yet known and to confirm those who have come to the saving faith. May your word pass from the ear to the heart and from the heart to the lips and from the lips to the life that you have promised. Your word may achieve the purpose for which it was sent through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, we are diving into a brand new chapter, but as we've talked about before, the chapter divisions, especially in this section of Proverbs, are pretty arbitrary. Um, it, we're still in that section where everything's kind of verse by verse by verse. Um, I just did some pre-recording for when I'm going to be on vacation in a couple of weeks. And yeah, you know, by, by chapter 24, 25, it starts to get a little bit longer in its narratives. But here we are. And the very first one well, it's certainly wise advice, and it certainly um, is something we must remember. Um, and and it, it, but it's caused consternation, I guess, where I'm from. That's why I'm kind of hesitating a little bit. Let's talk mm. about it. Verse yeah. twenty. I'm sorry, sorry, chapter twenty, verse one. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. I mean, obviously, that's true. Take us through that, though. Does it mean that we can never drink anything? Yeah, it, that's uh, clearly not what it even says, right? Um, yeah, but you you would think that that's clear. <laughs> but yeah, some people have used this as a proof text against all alcohol. Yes, they have. And yet our Lord himself, the first uh, miracle at the wedding of Cana, uh, blessed that uh, wedding with uh, an abundance of wine for the celebration. Yes, there is a lot of... Theological implication for with that miracle wasn't just for the wine, but to show that he is the true bridegroom and his gifts will never run out. There's much more there than just giving them a, a wedding present, but it was an amazing gift, and it involved the things that God gives. But everything that God gives can be twisted and abused. Even the greatest gifts, the great, great gifts of marriage, uh, the great gift here of the abundance of the fruitfulness of the earth can be abused. Um, uh, you know, even even feasting, you know, it's like, well, you don't want to starve, but even feasting can be abused. Um, we can abuse our bodies and and not take care of them and, and all the rest. So um, I think it's it's wise for us to look at it like that and to look at every gift that God gives like that. Maybe an extra bit of caution with alcohol, um, because, you know, if we're not wise with it, if we don't understand, um, you know, here with strong drink, that uh, it, it can be, it, that gift can easily be abused, and we can easily become looking very foolish, and we can easily hurt our reputations or hurt others around us, um, then we are acting very foolishly. We, we are not wise. Um, but when we use God's gifts, of celebration and thanksgiving and times of feasting um, to glorify him and to give thanks for him, then we're, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not prohibited from that. Um, so that's why I said it should be clear to us, but um, then we'd have to take the whole counsel of God together. At this point, we're, we're, we're uh, simply using this text to warn. It's a great right. warning against abuse. Well, and it is a chemical that has a certain effect on our thinking and our ability to think. Um, we can go to Psalm 104, uh, verses uh, 14 and 15, and it talks about the gifts of God. You, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man and oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen man's heart. It's clearly, these are gifts of God. Now, I'll tell you, I wouldn't do this just with any guest. You're, you're a mature, wise Christian, so I'm going to put you on the spot, and feel free to just move on if you want. But have you given any theological thought to things like 
marijuana, which is becoming increasingly legal across the country. It is also an intoxicant like alcohol. Yeah, when I talk to my members about it, you know, I definitely have many people that want to talk about it and ask me questions about my position or about and and sometimes the the right thing to do as a pastor is to just be honest and say, I don't know. I, I really don't know that much about marijuana. I, I don't. I don't know um, if uh, you can have some and your uh, inhibitions and your mental faculties are not. It's li- if it's like because I like I said I I just don't know. I don't know if it's like having a drink uh, a glass of wine and. And that's all that it is. I, I don't know. So I try to be honest with with my members to say, and and I ask them questions. What do you know? And mm-hmm. that this is the overarching principle that God wants us to be in control of our mind. God yes. wants us to be in control of our bodies. And if we take a substance that um, whatever that might be, marijuana or any other alcohol or any other kind of drug, and it leaves us to be out of control, or if we're taking it simply to escape. Um, the world, life, um, to be um, have sensitivities, uh, then maybe that's some caution. Yeah. Um, if there is a reason to take it because I have um, a certain cancer or right, a right. certain um, other, I see there's definitely research being done in all different directions or is research in Parkinson's or is research in many other things. And that's the area as a pastor, I'm like, I don't know. Uh, maybe there'll be ways in which it can be used, THC or marijuana or whatever, a derivative of this plant that could be used in a way that is a blessing. But my ignorance, I don't want to create a a law to someone uh, in which I'm just speaking because I've got a preconceived thought about it because I've watched a movie or a TV show or something, uh, or oh, my yeah. dare class told me never to do it. Right. Well, that's <laughs> right. good. That's good advice. That's good advice sure. for our children. Especially for middle schoolers. <laughs> yeah. There's no reason to do it. And there's a lot of research how it affects our brains as they're being developed. But same thing with alcohol too. Um, so, uh, then I would turn back to them and have that biblical conversation of why, you know, what does this mean? Why are we doing it? What's the benefit? And what's the uh, desired effect, right? Takes me back to Proverbs 18, verse 13, which says, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. You've avoided that, brother. <laughs> yeah. But no, I'm, I'm, I'm in the same place. You know, I, I, think, I, I think a lot about it from a legal point of view. That's my first degree is in criminal justice, applied criminology. Um, and, and, and so I have a lot of legal opinions about it. But um, in terms of biblical, yeah, it's something that I think is worth looking into. And I don't think it's worth burdening the hearts of people yet because there's a lot to be discussed about things like potency. But even things like alcohol or beer have taken on much stronger potencies yeah. than than what you're thinking of even in the New Testament here. Even wine and, and beers of the Middle Ages, you know, you hear people say, oh, the kids in Germany drink beer. Well, yeah, pretty watered down beer in in their history. Um, you know, there aren't kids throwing back, you know, Guinness or anything like that in Ireland or, you know, it, it's just, oh, maybe there are for all I know, but, but you get what I'm saying. It's, <laughs> yeah. If it's you get an APV of like 15%, it's right. like, oh my goodness, I am such a lightweight. I, uh, I'm like, oh my, I can't, I can't just, I, yeah, I don't drink. Well, they always told us at seminary, you know, when you yeah. go to the wedding, right? Have one, <laughs> Yeah, no more than one. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a struggle to be aware I, of. But you take a wise approach, and, and I guess that's just – that's the main message. I didn't even know what you'd say, but that's the main message I guess I want the listeners to know is don't be burdening people's hearts just yet. Recognize that a lot of gifts of God can be abused, and you mentioned um, food. That's certainly one that's abused, I think, in America, and I'm one of the guilty ones. Um, but at the same time, you know, God does want us to be in control of our faculties, um, and, and he says here, wine is a mocker, a strong drink, a brawler. So while they're gifts, they're also um, what well, we have to be in control of them, not the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move on. Verse two, the terror of a king is like the growling of a lion. Whoever provokes him to anger forfeits his life. So to me, this is this is like a counterpart to 
um, don't exa- fathers don't exasperate your children, but children have to obey <laughs> their fathers. In light of the fourth commandment, where we are to honor those in authority above us, um, we have to realize that poking the bear doesn't really get us anywhere. Um, but I don't know. Maybe I'm looking at that too simplistically. How do you see this? Yeah, I I do see it similarly, and I'm laughing because there's uh there's some videos I like uh, watching. Uh, every once in a while, you just got to have something to laugh about. And there's these ones where the dad's, you know, sitting on his recliner and the, they kind of set it up for dad to be pranked. And the mom yells at their like teenage daughter or teenage son, you know, hey, I, I need you to clean up your room. And the kid says something like horrible, like shut up, mom, or something. And the dad just goes like jumps out of his chair, like out of out of sleep. You know, it's like you poked the wrong part, right? You you pushed the wrong button. And then they have to quickly tell the dad, I was just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's just for us joke, you know, because, yeah, like the dad, you know, is uh, bring in some ways supposed to bring peace to the house. And we see this so many times in our ministry with a school like, hey, if there's dad there, there's a lot of, there should be biblically, as God ordained it to be, there should be some more peace there because everybody's in their place. And he kind of is a check to everyone. He's a marker of your place. You stay in your place, children. And and then it, the mom doesn't have to do things that the mom shouldn't have to do, you know, to to check those kids. That's It's my responsibility. And, and everybody can have someone to lean on. And the dad is supposed to be holding this responsibility to care for over the whole family. But <laughs> if you poke at him, right. he's going to he's going to have a snap back. And there's even those pictures of the real life lions with all these little cubs jumping. And then at one time, they're just swipes them away. You know, it's, it went too far. I'm far from a perfect parent, but I think that the times that I can recall overreacting, um, say, in disciplining my son particularly. Uh, my daughter is going to get there, but right now it's my son. He's 16. Um, is when he says something against his mother or says something mean to his mother or disrespects his mother. Like he can argue with me all day long and we can argue or or whatever. I'll want to hear his side. But once he starts, you know, shut up mom or something like that. Oh, I'm, he's never done that, thankfully for him. But that's, that's where I do. I come out of the chair, you know, and yeah. um, and while we have to, of course, bring calm, and that is it is valuable, I'm not blaming that on him. Yeah, it, it also is worth it not to provoke your parents. Well, as this applies to government, you know, if we treat every government official as if they are the enemy, then we shouldn't be surprised when they look down upon us. I mean, I, I think for as many times as we might complain about government, and rightly so by by the nature of our form of government, I think we should – probably meet that in equal if not greater measure with with um, prayers and praise and encouragement you know everybody writes their senator when they're mad about something when's the last time they wrote them and and thank them for their faithfulness yeah never <laughs> i don't i mean, yeah we, right. we uh, you're 100 percent right and and even when we um, are having a hard time respecting the person we definitely need to respect the office and god is the one who makes a king a king, makes the senator the senator, makes the president the president. And so, yeah, we owe respect to where respect and honor to, to whom honor is due. And so the office is owed that even when we're disappointed in the person. Speaking of honor, our third verse. It is an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife, but every fool will be quarreling. I didn't mean for this to be a political episode, but boy, that fits too. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it just seems like we live in a world that is um, bent on quarreling and fighting. And, you know, from the beginning where our inhibitions are uh, dampened and we want to mock and we want to brawl, you know, then it moves into about being a king and don't don't poke the bear into this, you know, quarreling. It seems seems to be sometimes the proverbs don't don't uh, often flow, but this one tends to flow this to this point. It does. It, it seems like he has, and I can't help but lean in this direction because it's Solomon too. Obviously, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, and his gift, his wisdom is a gift from God, but he was also a ruler. 
And, and so I think it should be unsurprising when a lot of the wisdom comes from his daily experience. And so I'm sure he's looking at that from both sides of, of the equation, both as one who is given the responsibility to rule and those who he has to deal with. In general, too, though, we live in a world of, and I've said this before, not the easily offended, but the eagerly offended. People are looking for a fight. And I think there is wisdom in discerning when it's just noise, just people fighting, and when it maybe is something that you should pay attention to. Um, I, I guess the most recent one that's coming across social media, and boy, it, it flies fast, is this recent you know debacle about people who are uh, upset at what the particular uh, gentleman said at that Catholic graduation, who's a kicker for the Chiefs, and then they're comparing him to the other gentleman. Um, I don't know his name, but he's uh, Taylor Swift's boyfriend. So, <laughs> so those guys, <laughs> people, I, I think it's, in, it's no, there's no problem commenting or even praising one, uh, but but people are really getting worked up. They're getting angry with each other over two football players that don't even know they exist. Is that worth our time? Yeah, I mean there, there, there are there are aspects of uh, the the speech that we could definitely, as uh, men's club Bible studies or as Bible studies, or just discussions, you know, Indeed. have good discussions and and talk about what where are we going as a society? What is what is the good? Um, what should be our ultimate goals? What what should define us as men and women and all these things? Um, but yeah, like. He wasn't even talking to you. <laughs> you know, it's like right. you, you weren't even there, but it's because it's posted. It's not like you, he was invited to come to a, a, a Catholic thing because he's a Roman Catholic. If you're not a Catholic and you want to be offended at it, well, it wasn't intended for you, but yeah, whatever. Don't, don't show up to most of our <laughs> pastor conferences. You're not going to be yeah. happy. No, no. Uh, you know, uh, but and yeah. And I just want to piggyback on that because I saw one pastor post online. He says, well, before long, they'll be sharing our sermons. Oh, please. No, don't stop. Right. Because, <laughs> because yeah, they're going to be offended. But it, it's not a problem that the content of the message gets out in the world, especially if it's something that's God pleasing. And from all I could tell, it was. Um, but but it's the strife part. Right. Like why get in arguments over if you're in someone and they just start getting angry about it? You know, maybe keep aloof from that strife because otherwise you'll just end up quarreling with a fool or you'll be the fool quarreling. Yeah, it's it's hard. There's been many times where someone brings to my office a quarrel and you, you try to, you know, calm things down or you try to whatever and you find yourself in the middle. <laughs> it's like, how did I get in the middle that now both people don't like me? Um, but it happens. So you just got to be careful in life to be understanding, to listen. Uh, and like you said, the other proverb talks about uh, listening and, and not being quick to give an answer, um, but to actually care about, you know, why are you upset? Why does this upset you? Tell me the parts that it's upsetting. What what, did, what do you think you heard? And sometimes people hear that. And it happens in sermons all the time, right? Tell me, what did you hear? Okay, let me show you my sermon. I actually didn't even right. say that. So, that happens um, yeah, and we can misunderstand, we can mishear, um, but if we can try, and I'm, I'm the chief of sinners, if we can try to listen, if we can try to, um, try to keep ourselves uh, above it, uh, then we can probably make some make some headway. But it is hard when people are just swinging away, not to, not to jab back to. No, and that is tough. And and certainly I don't make it sound – I try not to make it sound like it's just super easy. In fact, this is why we have the wisdom from Solomon. This is yeah. why we meditate on this word and why we need the Holy Spirit. Yeah. All right. Well, he's going to throw some shade at the sluggard some more. <laughs> we see that time and again. Verse 4 says, the sluggard does not plow in the autumn, and he will seek at harvest and have nothing. Well, that's infinitely expandable to all sorts of situations in life. But just to start with the literal, I live in a farming community, and um, this is a, a life where we are affected by the cycles of the seasons. Even the ebbs and flows of the congregation tend to match the times of planting and sowing and reaping. Um, but yeah, if you just sit around and do nothing, you can't expect anything to come of it. 
Yeah, you talked about at the beginning, there, there is a Christian debate on uh, wine and alcohol. There was a pretty strong debate in Christianity about uh, saving for retirement, retirement saving plan, Social Security, um, different things like this, too. And not, I, I'm, uh, let me be clear, not all those things I listed are completely the same. I'm not trying to lump them in the same category, but they have similarities about planning for the future. So it's an interesting um, reality in which we do have uh, this proverb that tells us it's not wrong to plan for the future. In fact, if we don't do some work today, the things that we want to have in the future or pray for for the future, great harvest, right? They won't come to pass. Um, so, yeah, it definitely gives us things to talk about with um retirements, with work, with savings for kids' education, or the even just a simple thought about what's the future. Obviously, the Lord is the Lord of the future and his will be done. Um, but does he want us to make plans? Does he want us to make preparations? And does he want us to be wise stewards? On this, it seems to be yes. Can that be taken too far where that's our hope? That's what we put all of our trust in. My 401k is X and I'll, I'm good. Let me build bigger barns. Um, probably we've gone too far and we've abused God's gifts. But again, it seems like the Proverbs have um, many applications that are similar through, throughout them. I'm just sort of contemplating on what you've been saying. And and yeah, you know, there was a time in the LCMS where things like fire insurance, we would just call it, you know, liability insurance or property insurance now. But yeah, those things were looked down upon. Um, but but now, of course, you'd be you'd be considered not a very good steward if your church didn't have those things. Right. So it's interesting how the plans of man or the intentions of man will shift even though the word of God remains the same. And, and I think that's also worth reflecting on whenever we're certain that God is against drinking, dancing, whatever. <laughs> um, you know, that's, that was my childhood. Um, then, then, uh, then you have to realize, well, is this me interpreting it in light of my cultural preferences or is this really what he says? And so, yeah, the slugger doesn't plow in the autumn. He'll seek, he'll seek the harvest and have nothing. We can't just sit back. God has given us the um, the tools and desire, hopefully, to be industrious. Not that we're having to work our way for salvation, but we do have to contribute in this life. That's how he's designed us. That's our first goal, to be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion over the earth. And that takes all those things, <laughs> take work. But I tell you what, we're right here at the break, so we're going to go ahead and take that. But folks, don't go anywhere. When we come back, Pastor Shank and I will keep on going through Proverbs chapter 20. See you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Wu. With me today is the Reverend John Shank, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Edwardsville, Illinois. Friends, don't forget, you can contact me at pastorboo at gmail.com or on Facebook with your questions, comments, and more. You can also call in with your comments ordinarily, but today, don't try that. The phones are down here at the studio, but that number for future reference is 1-800-730-2727. All right, let's get right back to the word of God. We have quite a few to get through, and we're going to be now with verse 5. 
the purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Many a man proclaims his own steadfast love, but a faithful man who can find. That's verses five and six, just sort of tack those together. So, yeah, the purpose in a man's heart's like deep water. You got to be wise to draw it out. I, I, I hear that of God. It's interesting to hear this concept spoken of by about a man having a, a you know the intentions and the purposes being like deep water yeah How do you make it um, yeah I, I don't know um it, it seems a little uh, at first a little confusing because the purpose but it is also in in 18 for as well this mm-hmm. this deep waters so there is a reality in which um, we study uh, psychology. We study uh, we study people's intentions, and we just study what's going on in someone's psyche and thoughts and heart and intention. And it does take a man of understanding to draw it out. It does take some deep counsel to try and draw out what is going on in someone's life, what is their purposes, what is reasonable, um, what even is it that they they desire and what is a man right and in the end it's only god god is the one who knows us knows our desires uh, knows our why we were created what is our purpose in our relationship to him and he's the one that ultimately draws it out of us and and out through his through his word um so i i that's how i take that yeah, I, commentators seem to be divided. I, I, I read one. This is Kyle Dalich, you know. I mean, they're very reputable and wise for most of the things that they do. And it says here, he, they talk about it in a negative way. They talk about the idea that, you know, his intentions are, he keeps them deep and secret and hidden, and, and that way he can deceive others. But if you're wise, then you'll be able to draw out his true intentions. I, and I'm not saying that's wrong. I, I just think that's maybe perhaps the negative approach, M- maybe a more positive approach. And, and perhaps they they both are supposed to be something we're reflecting on is that we don't always know why we do the things we do, good or bad. You know, it's it's like, you know, I, why do I sin? I sin, uh, but I, I can't um, I don't understand why I sin. It's so irrational. I love God. I love his law, I love his word. And yet I still fall into sin. Uh, and so sometimes you need that wise counsel to help draw out the issues. You mentioned psychology and counselors and uh, pastors and that sort of thing. Um, I don't know. I think it kind of goes both ways. I think it just also reminds us that sometimes not only do we not know the true intentions of others or what they're struggling with, but very often we don't even know it ourselves. And the man of understanding, human speaking, draws it out. But as you rightly said, the man of understanding, of course, is Christ who understands us better than we understand ourselves. And I I like what you were saying, though, because then it does fit with a few of the other verses that we'll come to with about the unequal weights, about the king and his eyes, about the king and his wisdom. Um, So that, that, uh, I, I, I like that a lot about, you know, really being wise to discern what that purpose uh, of that per are, are there good purposes or bad purposes right yeah yeah there'll be there's some a, proverbs here coming up well there's a funny meme where it shows a man and a woman uh in bed and you know they're not looking at each other and the woman's worried about the man because he's quiet and she's and has a little thought bubble and it's going through all the things she's thinking oh he's thinking about other women he's thinking about this he doesn't find me attractive all of her all the things she's worried about and it turns out he's just He's just worried about how to get his motorcycle to start. You know, <laughs> men, <laughs> men aren't as deep as, as some women like to think we are. But while that's humorous and it draws on stereotypes of men and women, the, the funny part about it um, really is true, though. And, and it's not limited to men or women. It, both human beings, uh, uh, you know, human beings are, are, are complex people. It's not always as simple as that guy wanted to cheat me. Uh, Maybe he was distracted because of something that's bad in his life and he gave you the unequal measures or maybe he's a crook and wants to cheat you. I mean, but but you can't you need to be wise to be able to draw that out. Yeah. Yeah. I like many a man proclaims his own steadfast love, but a faithful man who can find that that's six, uh, which I also read that comes up again in the in the Proverbs, because don't we know 
perhaps haven't we been at one time that person who certainly goes around telling people how great they are? <laughs> but is that true? Yeah, it's a little off-putting. Let's just be honest. When someone comes to us and oh, yeah. uh, or sends us an email proclaiming how you know, their, their own greatness. And I don't think they really understand what they're doing. Um, and they might think that they have the best of intentions, um, but it really does uh, put a bad taste in the other person's mouth. So it's probably best just to delete that part of the email. It's probably best just not, just don't say that part. If you think it about yourself that you have the best of intentions because you're a really good person and uh, you know, everybody thinks the best of you, uh, just delete that part and just right. go with the true, rest of it. If it's true, <laughs> then you can rest on that, right? You can yes, rest on that. That's don't you don't have it. to tell them. <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah. And you it, may not know this, but I'm kind of a big deal. I have many leather kind of big books. Deal. Yes, yes, <laughs> it really doesn't do well. But and then it says a faithful man who can find, you know, um, and that always makes us think. Well, the one, the one faithful one, the faithful Christ. And um, and we have a lot of a lot of uh, typology in scriptures where there's many faithful people of the of the Lord that point us to Jesus. But ultimately, the proverbs speak of Christ. Indeed, indeed, and 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 Christ, of course, was um, oh, he's he is the wisdom that's found in the wisdom literature. But he references proverbs and and the Psalms, and you know, I think. And, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't just know, and maybe you don't know either. I think Jesus quotes like the wisdom literature more than anything else. Mm, that that would be uh, yeah. I, I haven't. I haven't. It's worth uh, looking up, but I think that might it, be yeah. the case. Yeah, maybe because he is wisdom incarnate. At verse seven, the righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. Um, it seems practical on the surface. Is there something deeper to it? Uh yes. Um. So blessed are the children after him. So our minds um, think automatically of his like offspring. So the righteous who walk in his integrity, blessed are the children after him. So it's, it's not, I would say we're not just talking about biological children. You know, we have got a lot, I have got a lot of great examples of faithful men and women that I follow, but they're not, obviously my family was faithful too, but they don't have to be biological parents to become spiritual parents too. Right. right? And to be people, grandparents or aunts and uncles or all these family of Christ that we, we look up to them and we say that that's a life that I want to Im imitate and emulate in my life. Um, so I would point us in that direction as well. If you, if you want some great examples, well, Get yourself to church and get yourself into a Bible study. Get yourself into serving on some kind of, you know, board or committee, and and uh, get close to someone who's got a a bunch of gray hairs, <laughs> and you will be amazed at their wisdom, their patience, uh, and the way in which you can grow as a Christian. I haven't uh, parsed out the Hebrew here, but and, and I don't want to play a little too fast and loose with the with the grammar. But if we combine six and seven, at the very least, it reminds me of something. So many a man proclaims his own steadfast, but a faithful man who can find. Now, if we keep in mind that we already said, well, we can find that faithful man in Jesus. Then when we read seven, the righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. So obviously the his is referencing the righteous one. If the righteous one ultimately is Jesus, I think it, like I said, whether grammatically appropriate or not, I'm pointed to the necessity for us to uh, imitate Christ as we grow in our faith. And then, of course, our children are blessed if we are out there teaching them to look to the righteous man, which is Christ. And the one who keeps all the commandments, his generation is blessed for a thousand generations. Right. Uh, so we all become that blessing because Christ has kept the word of God. I'm going to read 8 and 9 together too. A king who sits on the throne of judgment winnows all evil with his eyes. Who can say, I have made my heart pure. I am clean from my sin. Hmm. Again, another question where the expected answer is nobody. 
Yeah, it it takes um, it takes the Lord to um, create in us a, a clean heart. It takes the word of the Lord to expose our sins, and then to be the one to um, redeem and reconcile us. You know, and, and even here, without the fullness of understanding how Christ will do it through His cross, and uh, His name will be Jesus. He is our Emmanuel because He bears all of our sins. You know. We, we still have the um, the sacrificial system that points them to the fact of of the Christ, the, the the son of the woman, the offspring, the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent, who will who will stand in our place and, and be our savior. He is the one who will be the one who makes us clean. Yeah, and the, and that it's the the king who sits on the throne who winnows all evil with his eyes. So he is the one who is doing this. The king does it. He's the one who makes us clean. He's the one who exposes our sins just by looking at you. He sees right. you. He and that I mean that's it's a terror terror to an unclean conscience that the eyes of God look upon you, but to you who have been washed clean and clothed in Christ, you're not terrified that God looks upon you because that is the blessed benediction that his, his face has turned to you in blessing and mercy. The, for the uh, verse nine, the question, you know, or the statement, I have made my heart pure. I am clean from my sin. It says, who can say that? The answer is no one, mostly because of that first clause. I have made my heart, I have made my heart pure. Um, but thanks be to God, we get to say, I am clean from my sin. Who can say that? Well, those who have been clean. But it also reflects on why uh, verse 6 is so crazy. Uh, Many a man proclaims his steadfast love, but a faithful man who can find. We can't walk around, um, you know, just just touting our own. And this is going to come up by the, again in Proverbs 24. It's going to come up again. But, but we can't go around saying that we um, are perfect because of our own efforts. And that's why it's – we're going to get other wisdom too from Proverbs about you know not sitting in places of honor. Jesus also reflects that in his teaching. Um, we don't go around uh, basically uh, tooting our own horn. I'm trying to think of another phrase, but tooting our own horn. We don't go around uh, building up ourselves. We should point to Christ, because that's where our glory is. I am clean from sin. Oh, you don't sin? I didn't say that, right? I didn't say that. I said that Christ has uh, cleaned me, cleansed me from my sin. Yeah, and and then in, in one way, you know, 9, verse 9, who can say I have made my heart pure, I am clean uh, from my sin, the one who can say that is Christ, is Christ because he claims our sins as his own. And then he yeah. pays for them with his sacrifice and he has been raised from the dead. Um, he has the power to take our sins and triumph over them. So in, in the one way, then he is, he is a faithful one who has won the victory. Verse 10, unequal weights and unequal measures are both alike an abomination to the Lord, to Yahweh. I think this absolutely connects to those because this I don't believe that this is just a, you know, hey, don't be fraudulent. Make sure that your measures, your weights are good. I don't want you to take advantage of the poor. And, and we've seen that time and again. And of course, that remains true. But in light of all this conversation about the righteous one, the one who cleanses from our sins, the one who judges us, it, it makes sense that the measures of judgment are going to be um, equal. The problem, though, is that we don't get what we deserve. So is this talking about dishonest merchants and faulty scales and weights to cheat their customers? Or is this talking about something greater? And don't say yes. Every Lutheran pastor just says yes. Don't say yes. <laughs> um, what's another? C. C. <laughs> ah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. of course, it's of course. It's Wait, nice, but tell us why. But. But why is it yet? Because the one who is um, being deceitful with his neighbor by stealing from him is also the one who is not weighing things out um, as, the, as God would have us weigh out all things, right? He has no, he's not giving any weight or any value to his neighbor. He's not weighing out the fact that his neighbor is a child of God. So 
how we treat each other and how we judge the value and worth of our neighbor is going to be affected and um, played out in in the ways in which we deal with each other. And then I would say you're you're 100 percent right that if we're going to be honest and look how, you know, it's been building up a sense of salvation and righteousness, then if we turn to our neighbor and we think we have more weight than them, right? I'm better than you. I'm more righteous than you. And so it's tipping in my scale. Then we haven't been weighing out and it goes right with verse nine then, right? Um, I, I am, I am clean from my sin, but you're not. So we're judging our neighbor in his sin, but we're not seeing our own sins. And that's the greatest struggle that we all face when we deal with each other. We, we think we're sinless. We haven't done any wrong. And the other side, well, they're down on the, you know, they've got all the weight. <laughs> they've done all the wrong. And it's like, well, come on, let's, can we see any way in which we, we both have some responsibility here? Um, most sometimes it's it's no and that's here here with the word of the lord it's telling us not to deal with each other with unequal weights the weight that i'm placing on you on your family on your children on your church i'm going to think my church is better or i'm better or uh, my family is better my ch-. you know it's how do we weigh out um what what kind of judgment we place on each other or just i'm a you know simply i'm a i'm a christian and you're not a christian it's like wow are we weighing out ourselves and holding ourselves to the same standard that we hold to everyone else? And and this happens all over the place, of course. And you you mentioned primarily, you know, Christians and unchristians. We often will um, condemn openly, often passionately, the sinful actions of the unbelievers. And there's certainly nothing wrong with proclaiming proclaiming God's word and judgment against sin. And yet, then ourselves, even fellow Christians, we let slide. Or we see that even in the secular world, um, you know, if we like somebody, then we're very much, you know, more understanding to them if we don't. Or in the political world, you know, a politician one does the same thing as politician two, but the followers of each defend them and accuse the other guy, even though they've done the same act. Uh, we, we're just so unfair with each other. And, and yeah. people say, well, thank God that he's unfair with us because we don't get what we deserve. And while that's immensely true, do not fall into the mistake of thinking that justice was not served, that 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 right. that the payment wasn't made. Right. Yes, we didn't make it, but it's made. Some there is no free lunch <laughs> to uh, put a, a a crass saying on it. You know, we look out there, and you know, people argue over things like student loan forgiveness and stuff, and somebody has to pay it, and, and that's true. And it, I don't it doesn't matter to me where you stand on that issue. But but my point is that yeah, there's no such thing as anything free. Uh, and so our salvation comes not because God put some unequal weights and unequal measures on the on the scales and kind of gave us a break. He poured out the intensity of the wrath that every human being deserves into the singular person, the God man Jesus. That's I mean, not only is it dramatic, but it really should make us just frankly want to do anything the Lord tells us to do. Yeah. And, and one of the things he tells us not to do is to have such a high expectation of other Christians. So we treat other Christians with a weight that we couldn't bear ourselves. So why do we do that? You know, why do we have a thought that they should be sinless and I am simul? <laughs> well, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm simul, but you should be sinless. And no, my, your your children, my children, myself, yourself, we're, we're we are going to sin, and yet we have an advocate. Let's let's deal with each other as as the Scripture clearly says of who we are. That none of us, like you said, have earned our salvation. So let's not expect other. If if that's true with our relationship with with God, let's not let's not make that our relationship with each other. You've got to earn earn your relationship with me. It's like, oh man, what are we doing? No. Yeah, and, and we are together to help us bear the burdens of our sins. We're not ignoring sin. We're not saying, oh, it's okay, you can sin all you want, and I'll sin all I want. Just the opposite. It's going to say, instead of judging each other and and causing disputes among brothers and sisters, why don't we do what God wants us to do and help each other bear the burden? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what we should do. Well, let's move on. Verses 11 and 12. 
even a child makes himself known by his acts, by whether his conduct is pure and upright. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, Yahweh, has made them both. Not sure those are together, but I read them together. Even a kid, even a child, even a young man is how it could be translated, makes himself known by the way he acts. Uh, I, I don't know. Is that is that like the child's pretending to be good but isn't? Or is it the child's actions will reveal how he or she will act as an adult in the future? Um, I, what, what do you think? And remember, the, the word both is forbidden. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, yes, I think that the actions will be revealed. And um, though if we are going, I just, I do think the two verses go together. So I want to talk okay. about that yes, in the please. sense that if we don't, if we use the, so often as Christians, sometimes we use God's word against each other. Isn't that horrible? Where it's like, ah, now I've got a like word a to kind of strike at you right? That see, I knew who you were from the beginning. You're just, and that person is just kind of waiting for someone to sin and just jump on them. That's who you are. It's like, no, they're a child of God. So if we think that we are sinless, and if we think we can just use God's word to, as a, as a club to beat each other up with it, then, then hear this, <laughs> the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. Right. right. God sees everything. God hears everything. God gives the hearing ear. God gives the seeing eye. So again, this balance, this, you know, the, the judgment, the balancing um, measurement that we use, um, let's not use God's word uh, to hurt each other, but to reveal our own need for forgiveness, our own need to act purely and then a call to each other, and then a call to each other and to our children to, to help them to see how they act reveals their nature and their, and their um, conduct. So help them to see that, you know, that there is a maturity to our, our overall life that we need to grow up and a maturity to our Christian life as well. Now, it's my theory that as Solomon is dictating these things to his scribes, there must be one guy in his court that was really lazy because out of nowhere comes another jab at the lazy people. Cause I think he just like walked past and then, and, and, and then, uh, and then Solomon goes, Oh yeah, write this down. Here it comes. Love, not sleep. Lest you come to poverty, open your eyes and you'll have plenty of bread. So he's taking another jab at the lazy condemned as a path to poverty. Now, yeah. Obviously I'm just joking, but looking at this more seriously, I think one concern here is not that it's not true. It is. But again, just like a weapon, I've heard so many people look at those who are in poverty and say, well, that's just because you're lazy. And I don't think that's right. It's probably it's probably not right. There's probably a lot of other things, medical conditions, uh, mental conditions that have played a big factor, drugs, alcohol, like we talked about at the beginning, can play a big factor. And right. so there's just – and life and and life can play a big factor this fallen world i when i read that this is what hit me right isn't it interesting that you know our context hits us you know you it seems like you're here yeah. hearing about a context within your congregation this one it just helps it helps me to see as we're kind of making our way through like you know we could easily fall on one side where it's like oh you know, um, God has done it all. We are saved by grace through faith. And it's, this leads us into laziness. And then it's like, don't be lazy. You know, you got to strive to, to be, have a pure conduct and upright attitude. Okay. I'm so great. Well, okay. But when we balance our, when we have these measurements, don't think yourself better than your neighbor. Oh, okay. Okay. So then I shouldn't do anything. No, don't. <laughs> it's like, he keeps, um, keeps us on this, balanced way of following Christ where Christ is all in all. Yeah. Amen to that. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I'm going to give you uh, 60 seconds for verses 14 and 15. So here we go. Bad, bad says the buyer, but when he goes away, then he boasts and there is a gold, there's gold in abundance of costly stones, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. So a little bit more fraud, a little bit more wisdom talk, take us through that and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. 
yeah if we when we look at this um you can see all the all the tv shows where they're uh bartering with each other and they're like this is a horrible thing and then they walk away and be like i ripped that guy off right um but uh overall it, it's kind of giving us a bigger picture right that how we deal with each other lays out what we value and how we love each other and so just our conduct towards each other should reflect our faith and um all, overall there is there is a golden abundance of costly jewels but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel right the the words of our lips should be the word of christ and his word is the precious jewel of wisdom that keeps teaching us who he is and who we are in him and that instructs us of how we should treat our neighbor and how we should love them above all things o- over ourselves, right? Christ is first and our neighbor and our love for him is our greatest gift that we can provide uh, our love for them. Great way to end the show. Uh, folks, that's been the Reverend John Shank, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Edwardsville, Illinois, to whom I'm thankful for being on the show. And come back tomorrow, Pastor Tyler Hopmeyer will be with us to finish up the rest of this chapter. Until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.